Hi, I'm disability lawyer David Brannon. In this video, I'm gonna take you through an interview that I did a few weeks ago with someone named Rob Stevens. Now this video format that we're doing here is part of an interview series, a little different than some of the other videos on the site, but this is an interview series where I'm gonna be speaking with different people within the CPP disability community, world, industry, however you wanna say it. Rob was the perfect guy to have for our first of these videos. I ran across Rob one night while I was doing like everybody does, in bed on my iPad, looking at YouTube videos, seeing what's going on. And I was checking out stuff on this channel and I found a video that Rob did about CPP. Now, I, I hope that everyone here will go check out that video and we're gonna have a link for it below. But the Rob was extremely, extremely credible, likable guy. And he did something extraordinary. He was able to, as someone who lives with fibromyalgia uh, he was able to get approved on CPP disability on his own without a lawyer or any other help on the first try. Now, normally I would tell you that that is not something you should expect or shoot for, uh, but Rob was able to do it. And there's we cover in the video why I think that he was successful, and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to learn some of this as well. So one of the things I do want to point out is there was some problems with, with, with the uh, video recording for Rob. So you're just gonna see a picture of his face, but trust me, you're not gonna to wanna to miss this. It's a great conversation. And I do wanna thank Rob again for agreeing to do this. And I hope you enjoy the video. Let's go check it out. We're here today with Robert Stevens. Rob, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. Awesome. Can't complain. Man. Yeah, yeah. Now, I wanted to uh, just let everyone know uh, this is our first official recording. I guess unofficial or official. It's our first recording where we're doing interviews with different people within the CPP disability world. And very excited to have Rob on the line today because I, you know, I was laying, I literally was laying in bed one night basically just Googling up my own YouTube videos on CPP disability to see how they're doing and just was interested to see what one came up. And I, boom, there was your video, Rob. And honestly, I, I, uh, my wife was asleep, but I was like, Oh my God, I got to talk to this guy. And I actually reached out to you right away. And, and we, we were talking within our content team here and I was saying, Rob has got to be the first guy. <laughs> when we start this series of interviewing people, Rob definitely has to be the first guy, Rob. Your video was fantastic. I'm, I'm not going to lie. And it really was authentic um, in so many ways and it struck a chord with me. So here we are. Here we are. And I'm so glad you agreed to do this. So let's, let's just dive into it, Rob. And, and just so people know, your YouTube channel is uh, Canadian Senior in Retirement, I believe. Yes. Yeah. We're Canadian gonna Senior in Retirement. Yeah. We'll, we'll put a link down below so people can go check that out. It's a fantastic channel. And this video, you've got other videos. Uh, you've got a great video on fibromyalgia. So I would encourage everyone to go and check out that channel and see some of Rob's other content. But Rob, give us a little, so the purpose what we want to do with these, with this uh, interview series is just to talk to people about their experiences with, with the CPP disability process and system. Uh, we're going to be bringing on a variety of people. Um, uh, we have some inter very interesting guests coming up who have worked within the government and in the program itself so we can get different uh, views. But your view is, is going to be someone who did their own CPP disability claim, as I understand it. And I just want to talk a bit about that because I think people are very interested to know what is it actually like uh, going through this process. And I think, you know, I know because I've, I've been reading all your stuff here that you had a very uh, it wasn't an overnight journey with this. And this is something that uh, you have been dealing with for years. So just start out, Rob, just get, let everyone know a little bit more about you. And then we can get into like, when did, when did this journey start that ended up with you applying for CPP disability? But just give us a little background about yourself, just so people know. And please tell everyone where you are right now, because I love that background. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in what I would consider to be called my man cave. Um, it's an addition I put on my garage about seven years ago, and um, it's actually heated, air-conditioned, 
um, you know, it's got a big screen TV and internet and, and uh, um, it's set up as a, uh, at one time it was set up as a woodworking shop, but when I got struck down with uh, uh, fibromyalgia after having a, a work accident, um, I couldn't, I couldn't hold on to things with my hands anymore properly and I didn't feel safe um, working with uh, table saws and, and, and the like um, as a hobby like I had before. So I, um, about a year and a half ago, I cleaned up the room and, and uh, I made it into an office. So um, yeah, so it, it, it was, um, it's been quite the uh, um, the roller coaster, um, you know, the the fibromyalgia. Because in the beginning, like a lot of people, I think I, I had no idea what was going on. Um, I had an accident and um, on a construction site, the uh, a set of stairs collapsed, and I dropped about you know, eleven and a half feet to the concrete. And um, you know, being being a stubborn um, work ethic type person. I actually um, went home, laid down, got up, went back to work the next day. I could hardly stand up straight. And the guy that I worked for said, "What? What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I, I got a job to do. I got to get it done." And he said, "No, not you. You go. Have you been to the hospital?" I said, "No." <laughs> he said, "I just took some painkillers and here I am." And he said, "No, no, no." He said, "You get, you get uh, to the hospital and." Um, and, um, uh, I guess, you know, that was sort of the, the start of it all. Um, I've been to the doctor many, many times, um, you know, before that with, uh, with aches and pains and, and osteo osteoarthritis and so on. But, um, so I, I could have very well had fibromyalgia before that accident, but I think that accident was what, Put it um, on the top, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it it, um, it it was the defining moment, I think. Personally, I, I don't have fibromyalgia. I have worked with many people with fibromyalgia, so I do know how difficult it is, especially a man with fibromyalgia. That is not as common in my experience. Uh, fibromyalgia is typically more common in women, so I don't know if that presented any unique challenges um, for you, but um, certainly I know from working with people that fibromyalgia, it's very different person to person. And so it's, I always encourage people don't judge or make assumptions because just cause you know, your sister has these issues and can do this. That doesn't mean that that's other people's experience. Right. Yeah. It's um, you know, it, 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 the hardest part is for me was coming to grips with um, that. I had this um, and what kind of put me in the direction of it even more. It wasn't really my doctor. Um, she would say, you know, it, it, it's like uh, you're getting older and, and you know, the, the, that's the way it is and all that. But a good friend of mine um, went to have dinner with him and he said he had fibromyalgia. And I said, well, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. He said, well, he started explaining. And then uh, that's when I started doing a little bit of research. And, you yeah. know, when I went back to doctor, I said, I think I might have this. What, what can we do to see? And that, that's kind of where that was. Now tell us, Rob, like, how did it, how did you come to get to the point where you decided, okay, I need to, I should apply for CPP disability. Like from the time of your accident, like how long was it from where things started to affect your life up into the point in your work up to the point where you actually applied for the CPP disability? I got hurt in 2016 and you know, the first job that I had after that, after my recovery, I was off work for, if I remember correctly, about six months after that accident. Yeah. Um, I ended up a broken foot, a broken toe, you know, my my back, my the whole back of my body was black and blue, shoulders, arms. From when I, when the stairs collapsed, I, I was grabbing the walls and, and trying to stop myself from going down. And I actually went back to work and... I just started noticing things like my, my, my fatigue level was in, like off the charts. 
I would come home and, and I would be in bed at like seven o'clock at night. Everything, everything started to hurt. Not just, you know, it's, it's interesting with fibromyalgia, you, you, you just, it's almost like a head to toe thing where, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, if you go out to the gym and lift weights or whatever, you know, you might have a sore or shoulder or whatever, but fibromyalgia just radiates from toes to head. And uh, so anyhow, the, um, uh, the first job that I had when I went back to work, I started noticing that I, I couldn't focus and I couldn't remember things. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then I, I ended up figuring out that, that through research that that is what they call fiber fog, you, you know, where and be, being a computer guy, you know, it, it was insanely difficult because I would be sitting in front of somebody's computer and literally forget what I was doing. And that led me to panic. Yeah. and get anxiety and all of those things and eventually that job ended up you know the, the you know the people i worked for said you know we can tell that you're you're 120 percent but you know you you i don't think you can do this job anymore yeah. and so i i ended up leaving and and, and over that five-year period i i I believe I worked for six different companies and all of them had the same result and they all felt, you know, extremely bad for me because I have a, I have a inherited work ethic from my dad and my mom and, and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to leave the burden of supporting our family to my, to my wife. The last year before I got diagnosed, I was in to see my doctor, I believe 47 times. Oh, wow. um, complaining, you know, that I feel like I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And she sent me MRI, CTIs, everything humanly imaginable she sent me for. Um, and then finally, uh, I said, I, 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 I want to go see a specialist. And just before she retired, she sent me to see a specialist. And uh, the specialist, uh, you know, I sat down with her for about three or four hours. And she said, okay, I'm going to send you to one other person, which was a a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and um, between the two of them within a few days came back to my doctor and said he, he's got he's got fibromyalgia he also has ADHD oh he's, he's got mental health issues because of the ADHD over all the years and trying to figure out ways to get through life because the ADHD is, um, is, is one of those things that causes people to have all kinds of bad side effects. Uh, so finally, I uh, I convinced the doctor to let me apply. And like I said before, my my doctor, who is a fabulous lady, um, a fabulous doctor, but in her mind, only people that were, as she put it, near death yeah. got approved for CPP oh, disability. Yeah. That stood out to me in your video when you mentioned that. So this was not a nasty doctor who was, you know, but, but she did, it sounds like have her own belief system around what she thought CPP disability was. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I tried to explain to her, you know, that, you know, I wasn't trying to not work. Mm -hmm. I just basically, I could not, you know, I spent my whole life being a, an exceptional, reliable hardworking employee, CPP disability, you know, if you go to their website and you read what constitutes somebody being disabled, one of the things it says is, is the inability to hold down a job on a regular basis. You know, uh, every day is a, is a whole new box of chocolates because I don't know one day to the next right. what abilities I'm going to have when I get out of bed. And I, I expect people watching this, there's going to be people who are in the same boat that you were, where they don't have a bad doctor. They're not necessarily a, a bad person, but their belief system is that they have a different idea of what they think would, what it means to qualify for CPP disability. And what I find is some doctors think that it's a much higher level of disability. They're applying like their medical idea of disability. They're thinking person in a wheelchair, someone who needs attendant care from others. Uh, that is not what the disability of CPP is obviously right. Like you can actually still work part-time and get CPP disability. It's this idea that you can't work regularly. And this is with anyone suffering from chronic conditions, but particularly fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, any of these types of conditions where it's just 
unpredictable. I mean, you, you could get up one day and just, you have to stay in bed or you, you know, you're going to be bad days. And this is the idea that CPP is, it makes, it's the idea that you can't be employable and be a regular dependable person showing up on a regular schedule. I find there does need to be some education with doctors, but I'm wondering like, did, did that doctor get to the point where they finally did agree to do the CPP disability or how, how did it come that you got supported? Cause I assume some doctor supported you with the CPP application or it wouldn't have been successful. My regular doctor went on leave. I think it was like a trial retirement thing for her. Mm -hmm. And I went in to see her replacement and she looked at the screen of my profile or my, um, you know, my, my medical history. And she said, like, you know, you, you, you have had, you <laughs> yes. know, I, I think you said 46 had, visits, you know, a few years of, uh, of, of feeling very bad or terrible or whatever. And I said, I said, I said, to be honest with you, I said, I, I've been trying to get Dr. to yeah. fill out the forms for disability for me, but she kept saying that I would never get, you know, approved. And this doctor looked at me and said, well, I'll fill them out. No problem at all. Yeah. You yeah. Know, you're, you're definitely a, a person that should yeah. qualify. Um, and that's, uh, that's how, uh, how that started. You know, it's now so random. It's so random. And I guess I should have introduced this in the beginning. Like one of the things that your video talks about is you, you applied for CPV disability and got approved on the first application. Um, but this is so typical and it shows how random and unfair things can be like just the randomness of having that different doctor come in or some people randomly have a doctor who better understands the system and some who don't. I don't know that you attempted to do this, but you did. The way you dealt with your doctor was what is what exactly that we recommend people do when you have a doctor who doesn't support you. And I don't know. I, I'm sure you weren't. I think it's just who the kind of guy you are. Like you did what I recommend. Like you continue to work with that doctor. You continue to try to work. The best thing you can do in these situations is one, try to get the doctor educated about what the program requirements really are, which is tough because some doctors, they just don't want to be educated by their patients. And this puts it in a, this makes it a difficult situation. The other thing that you did was continue to try to work, continue to work with the doctor with their treatment plan. Usually doctors will come around, especially if you can get education material to them so that they realize that they're not correct in how they're viewing the CPP disability. It's so I'm glad that you, you had that new doctor come in and that, that is, that does show though, that if you have, if you've done everything you can and it still doesn't work, that changing doctors may be something you have to think about. Although I would really stress that should be a last resort. Yeah. And I, you know, when I um, was in to see the the new doctor, I, I broke down and and I said, you know, I just can't, mm -hmm. I, I can't deal with this anymore. I, I need some help. And I said, I know that, you know, disability doesn't pay a lot of money, but I said, I'm in a situation where I can no longer work. Mm -hmm. So if that money is, it, 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 you know, it's 1100 and something dollars a month that, you know, that I, I wouldn't be getting. And right. I said, you know, I'm, 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 I'm maybe more fortunate than others. You know, my, my wife's an accountant, you know, we're, we've always been good with our money and all that. So, but it could have been, you know, like for a lot of people, this is like the, the difference between putting food on the table and, and not so oh absolutely it, it is important, it is important for people to understand you know that this this is a disability it's not a people you know i i'm in pain i hurt there's there's a lot of other sides to fibromyalgia and, and like you've said you know it, it it affects everybody differently i i've been in this space for a long time and i used to do a lot of we still have a website, obviously, and content, but I turn comments off uh, because there's so many trolling people that can get in there. And some people mean well, but they will make kind of absurd comments about fibromyalgia. They even sometimes make absurd comments about CPP disability. They don't realize like your experience is not going to be everyone. And the thing with CPP, fibromyalgia, it's very unique. You need different approaches. Funny, because when I went through law school, back then, fibromyalgia was it was legitimately being fought in the courts over does it exist. So when you were going on a fibromyalgia case, 
you not only had to prove that the disability from the fibromyalgia, you had to prove that it was actually a thing. <laughs> and um, I, it, I, I, it's come a long way since then. I actually did a paper, a, a paper in law school on fibromyalgia in litigation to um, kind of review all the court cases. And we've come a long time since then. So now fibromyalgia is not questioned. Does it exist? Now it's just a question of what level of disability you have. Um, Rob, one thing um, I think I wanted to ask you about that really stood out to me is, now you, you talked a bit about, uh, one of the things that I picked up and I was thinking, why was, why was Rob successful on this first application? Number one, this idea that you worked five, six or seven jobs over a number of years and essentially worked yourself, what I call working yourself to the, going off the cliff type of thing. Uh, you, your situation is very common to what I see is where people are stubborn and me, in your situation, your doctor wasn't really supporting you on the claim. So you just kept trying and trying. And it's a dangerous thing actually, because people will work themselves to the point of a mental breakdown. And it, uh, I don't know your, all your situation on, but I would expect that you, uh, someone who works that long and struggling, you would eventually hit a mental breakdown and you don't obviously have to talk about that, but, um, that is the unfortunate thing is many people do work past the point of when they should have applied years ago and get into this mental breakdown situation. And then it just compounds everything, right? Um, it, it affects all your life. It makes everything harder to do. Um, and it's very unfortunate. So I would say anyone watching this, if you are that person, that type A person who's do not work yourself to the point of a complete mental breakdown, you, you want to try to get ahead of this thing. But uh, I don't know, Rob, if you have any comments on that as someone who's gone through this, but that, that is my experience with people. From 2016 on, I got hurt not only on, on jobs. Um, I was actually on um, workman's comp three times, I believe, in that period because I had fallen off ladders. Uh, I was from fatigue. I, I literally was so tired, I went to grab the top of a ladder to hold onto it. Luckily, I was only you know, like it was a six foot ladder, mm -hmm. but I ended up falling down and landing on my back. One of the things that I did after I got hurt on the construction site is I thought, well, maybe I'll change to a different type of job. Through um, the government, I, I trained to drive a truck Yeah. because I thought maybe I could do that. Um, you know, one of the first jobs that I had doing that, you know, the fatigue thing again, um, and, and grew up in my hands. That's one of the biggest problems I have is I, um, and, and apparently rheumatoid sufferers have this problem as well as fibromyalgia. Um, you, you can just be grabbing a hold of something and, and, and lose your grip. Yeah, just absolutely. Lose your grip. So I was working on a job when I was driving the truck and was pulling on a chain that was up above me over my head. And I lost the grip of it and it came down, hit me in the head. Um, I had a big gash on the side of my head. And then it, I, at that point, I, I was just about where my wife was. That's it. Like, you, you, yeah. you're not working anymore. And that, you know, you, you, you can't keep getting hurt. And I did hit rock bottom. I ended up in, and I'll say it, I, if it helps other people, you know, I ended up in the hospital because, yeah. you know, I, I just completely... I had a meltdown and, and one day I, I, I drank way too much and, and I ended up in an ambulance and in the hospital overnight. Yeah. And that was also the, that was also the final straw, you know, where, where I said, you know, I, I got it into my mind that I cannot work anymore. I just can't safely do it. So I got to stop. That was in, you know, whenever that was and, and, you know, never had a drink since, you know, I, I started to come to realization that my health is what it is and I got to try to make the best of it. It's so hard, Rob. Like, um, I really uh, appreciate you sharing your situation. I, I see it just as an observer and it's so hard to see people. I, 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 I say you, they basically drive the car off the cliff and I really encourage, because people sometimes reach out to us early and I encourage them, do not work yourself to the point, get help, get in a support group. It is very hard. And you went through this. It is very hard when your life, your, your, like your life is changing. Like people identify themselves with their work. Uh, they're at the uncertainty of it all. It, it, it is such a difficult thing to try to come to terms with. 
And I did know in the, notice in the video, you talked about that you went through different courses and programs to learn how to deal with uh, what I would call uh, sometimes in some ways, fibromyalgia has physical symptoms, obviously, but I find overwhelmingly it's the dealing with the psychological impacts of it. Um, the fact that you're losing certain parts of your life. Uh, there's a grieving process that people go through. Like, did, did you, uh, you mentioned that you reached out for some supports. Is that true? Uh, and you, if it's so, what type of supports did you get to help you deal with this? Because the, you have to learn psychologically how to deal with this situation to have success uh, with the CBP application or just with your life going forward. And uh, I'm just wondering, Rob, what you did there with the, the courses and things like that. Um, one of the things was my doctor's office had a 10 week pain management course. And it, the interesting thing was there was two men out of 15 people. What they, what they taught us in this course was your, your pain is basically, um, unless something miraculous happens, your pain isn't going to go away you need to be able to use strategies and figure out ways to, um, to live through it. So trick your mind into going to that bad spot. I'm somebody that was always like a bull in a china shop. So, yeah. you know, so now I, I, I will do little projects around the house or for my wife and I'll do 10 minutes one day and then I'm whipped. So, but, and in the beginning, it pissed me off, and I would continue. And then the next day, I could hardly get out of bed. So yeah. what they taught us in this course, and I recommend anybody to do this. To, Absolutely. To, to, you know, it, not only does it show the, you know, the people who, you know, run the disability programs and your doctors and everybody else that, you know, that you're trying to – nobody will ever – you know, give you a hard time for trying. No. Nobody will ever fault you for trying. So I, I did that course. It taught um, time management, not overdoing it. Um, nutrition. Yep. Nutrition is, is a huge thing for fibromyalgia. I, I, I'm like a radar. If I eat a hamburger, yep. cook, I'm over. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I change and dairy I paid dearly for it on a personal level you know I had to learn how to accept the fact that I could no longer do what I always could do and I mean part of that is getting older but a lot of it for me was I just physically and mentally can't do what I used to do and I had to figure out ways to still feel valued you know yeah and that's oh, absolutely your video, uh, by the way, still trends near the top of, of the CPP videos. And I think uh, the way you're giving back by giving this information, by doing the videos is fantastic and so important um, for people to know that they're not the only ones dealing with this. It's good to see someone who's successfully done this on their own. And I, I give you total, um, it's not easy to get approved for CPP disability on your own, especially with fibromyalgia and chronic pain being the cause of disability, very hard to be approved on the first application. So part of the reason I want to talk to you is go through, well, how did that happen for you? Like, I, I, I can see why you got approved on the first application. Like you're talking, you went through a six, seven year uh, trying to stay at work that I can't overestimate how important that is. And that that would, your credibility just went way through the roof with something like that. Uh, this thing, that, this idea that you, you sought out treatment and you went into these uh, a program the 10 week program or eight week program, whatever it was like, that is again, um, the biggest reason that anyone would be dis would be denied is this idea that they didn't try. And so you are someone who is just off the charts on trying. And I would encourage anyone out there who is thinking about doing CPP disability. You really want to follow Rob's model of how he persevered. Now don't go like he did and work to the point of a breakdown because you will everybody break. Everyone has a breakdown. I don't care how tough you are, how type a, everyone breaks down and I've worked with everyone from CEOs of large companies to doctors themselves. I've even worked with people who work in the insurance industry who, who are doing CPP disability or any type of disability claim and everyone breaks down. Nobody is resilient enough. It's, some people just have more resilience than others, 
but I find those people crash worse because they go so far beyond uh, where I call it like the white knuckles that they just fall off the cliff. Right. And, and you got to hope that yeah. someone's there to help and catch you. Um, so tell us about people like to know, Rob, like, so you did this on your own. How does someone, and how did you go about, you know, you're, you're going to apply for CPP disability. What do you do next to get, make that process happen? Like, how did you take us through how you, uh, said, okay, I'm going to get the forms. I'm going to apply. Just take us through that process that you went through to apply. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is I, the first thing I did is I went to Google, you know, one of the sites that came up was yours. Right. Um, and watching the videos on your site, um, and, and reading some of the information, yeah. um, you know, that, that was a starting point for me. Um, and, you know, going back to, you know, I, I've always been somebody that even though, um, you know, I, I had issues like ADHD and whatever throughout my life that I didn't even know about. But now that I look back on my life and some of the, you know, the the issues I had with staying focused and, and so on, I it, it, it all makes total sense now. You know, the first thing I did is I, I read about as much as I possibly could consume um, on what it is, what it does, how it affects you. Um, watch, you know, videos and went to different websites like your own. The one thing that kept coming up throughout all the different research that I did was detail. Yes. Um, you know, when I filled out those forms, I actually, it took me, it took me 18 days to fill out those forms. Yes. And, and I included, I believe, at least 10 pages, extra pages mm-hmm. of of explaining my what my life had, I guess you could say, become yeah. from what it was. Um, you know, I, I talked about you know the the ability to no longer be able to reliably hold down a job, and and this is why. So you did go into detail. <laughs> I talk about. I talk a lot about people who do a bare minimum claim. They just fill in the forms, just fill in the boxes, the space is available, send it in. And with one medical report from the doctor, that's, that's what a lot of people do. That is usually a recipe for denial, even if you legitimately are disabled. So it sounds like you did not follow that approach. You did not do the bare minimum. No. And I, I also, um, one of the things that my doctor said nobody has ever done that she ever knew of was I asked for every single bit of my medical file from the day I got hurt. Yes. So that like five years or six years or whatever of, of, my medical file, I wanted that included in the, the application the package yeah. that they would send. And I also told my doctor, I said, I don't, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but this is my life. So before you send out that package, I want to see it. Yeah. And she was like, oh, no problem at all. She said, no problem at all. Because I said, I want to make sure that the teaser... Yeah, you know, crossed and dotted or whatever that expression is. Yeah, but I just said that I, I know that I, you know, I I said I I I'm not in a good frame of mind. I said I don't want to deal with this with all kinds of appeals and it, and everything else. Yeah, I I want to I want to do it to the best of my ability. What I got um, on the first attempt and. You know, hopefully, you know, that will, um, you know, that will make it um, successful. And, and so that's, that was the, you know, the first um, part of it, you know, sending it all, <clears throat> sending it all off to the disability people. You made so many good choices, Rob. I, I, I you know. I do love the researchers. I mean, we are an education first organization. We live to help the researchers out there. So you did your own research. You were, you were learning what to do, obviously. Um, a lot of people don't take our advice. Um, sending, I can't state how important it was that you sent in your whole medical file. A lot of people resist that, but what you don't understand is like, that tells a story. And in your situation, if I was representing you, the first thing I would have did was got all your medical records going way back to when you had your first injury, because that shows a a story. It shows all the struggles, all the medications, all the visits. It would be hard to look at your medical history and not think this was a serious situation, right? 
this is not a this is not a thing where you 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 would have such a lot of information there that it would tell the whole story and it would back up everything you're saying. Whereas if you had just sent in that, if you had just sent in the form with a few things talked about here and there, they would have no concept of the real, you know, story behind this whole thing and the seven year struggle. Like um, that was, that was such a smart decision. I, I am convinced you would have been approved eventually, but sending in that medical file, I expect that was one of the things that put this thing over the top because it would have showed that everything, it would have confirmed that you're a credible person and everything you're saying it lines up. What about after, so you send it all in. It's very common uh, with anyone who applies for CPP disability on their own. It's very common that you're, you'll get one or two calls from the medical adjudicator. First call usually is just that we got your application. We're going to be looking into it. Could be four months. We'll get back to you type of thing. Uh, then they usually call you back in what I call an interview call where they want to talk and get more information, confirm things. Uh, did, did that happen with you, Rob? What was your experience? Did you have any dealings with the adjudicator? After I sent in the documents, I think it was about two months later. I can't remember the exact time frame, but I got a call from a lady and she just basically asked me my name and my social insurance number and my date of birth <clears throat> and that I had sent in, you know, the forms and she was acknowledging that. And then she said that I would return or receive another call from adjudicator. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, and then I got the first call from from the uh, adjudicator, and and she basically, it, it, I would say it was like, a, I think what they're trying to do with that first call is just sort of weed out, you know, maybe somebody that doesn't really need or have the the issues to qualify. I, I don't really know, but I spoke with the lady for about fifteen minutes, and she asked me questions about my employment you know, what happened on my jobs. In my video, I know I use the expression, sell yourself. And I, I felt yes. after I said, I, I felt like maybe that was the wrong word because I shouldn't have to really sell the fact that I'm ill. But in reality, it, it, you've only got so much time to speak with these people mm -hmm. and you need to let them know what you need them to, you know, to understand. And so she asked me about medications, she asked me about limitations, physically, mentally, and so on. And I don't think I cried during that phone call, but I, I'm yeah. sure she could tell that, you know, that I was emotional. And, and I, I said, I don't want to not work, but I said, I, I just, I, I said, I've been, been hurt so many times and I'm worrying my wife. And I said, I, I gotta, I gotta you know, contribute any way that I can to our family. And this is one way that I can do that. So absolutely. Um, and she said, okay, I'll, I'm going to go through your file some more. And then I got a call back about four and a half months from the time I, I sent my paperwork and she called me again and she asked me some more questions. And, um, and the one question, you know, the interesting thing is in November of 2019, I think it was, I had to renew my driver's license for driving a truck. And she said to me, well, you renewed that and, you know, you, you passed, you know, the physical for it. And I said, yeah, I did. But I said, the rest of that day, I was basically, you know, on painkillers and lying flat on my back because I was in so much agony. And I just truthfully, I said, you know what? I'm scared. I don't know what's going to come of, of all of this. I needed to try to keep that license because yeah. if, if all else didn't work and I didn't get approved, get hurt or not, I would probably have to try to work. So, and you know what? She, you know, she said, I, I can understand that. And yeah, I absolutely. said, secondly, yes. I, I said, they might, they might come out with a magic pill, um, you know, to help us. And if they do, I, I didn't want to eliminate one avenue of, you know, of, of being able to work. I think very much appreciated my, my complete. 100%. Oh yeah. 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 So that's, that's, that's how, uh, and I think that, you know, they want to, like you said before, they want to know that you're trying and they want to know that you don't have to, I don't think, you know, you don't have to 
put on a show that you're, you know, you're on your deathbed. Um, you know, you're still a human and you're still going to give it your best shot, whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. Because I have days I get up, I don't feel too bad and I can do some stuff but not reliably. So that's that. Something we do, and I know that the CPP adjudicators do this, is once they get all your medical and the whole application, they go through and look for what I would, I call them red flags. So that, the fact that you applied for your license and passed it, they would have marked that as a red flag for follow-up. Um, so that is why they came to you and followed up on that. Um, one of the things you can do when you're preparing these applications is try to anticipate what some of these red flags would be and you can address them yourself, but, or you just address them when they bring them up. Uh, Cause sometimes you can't anticipate what they're gonna think are all these red flags, but now you dealt with that perfectly. Now I can't agree more with this idea of selling yourself. And now selling often has a dirty connotation to people. They think you maybe you're gonna lie or you're gonna, you know, they think a used car salesman, but, it is so, so important. And this, this is one of the things when I was watching your video at night, I was like, yes. Oh, I can't believe he said you have to sell yourself. That is the number one thing where I think what I would call a winnable case is lost because the case was not sold properly, presented properly would be another way to say it to the decision maker. And in this case, you were dealing with the medical adjudicator. So you have to present the case and your information in a way that it meets that person's expectations, beliefs, incentives. Um, it's really one of the core things that I try to teach people and how we do things is this idea that when you're starting one of these claims, you have to start with the decision maker you have. Is it going to be a CPP adjudicator? Is it the judge? They have different expectations and beliefs. And you probably weren't thinking this. You had, you knew the idea of selling it, but it's the idea that you now have to think, okay, what, what are they expecting? What's important for them to see? And I got to make sure that I present all that to them because most cases are lost that are winnable are lost because either the wrong information was presented, the wrong focus was put on it, or they're just the lack of it, right? The lack of information is often a factor there. So I really want to like one plus your, uh, this idea of selling yourself in the proper way. We, I call it telling your story is a, is a better way. I talk about, you have to learn how to tell your story but not just tell your story in a way that makes you feel good. Tell your story in a way that meets the expectations, beliefs, incentives of whoever the decision maker is, because ultimately your hand, you're in their hands. Like you were in the, that APP adjudicator could have said yes or no. And the story you presented to her was more powerful than a negative story against you. So, you know, that, that, that yeah. is ultimately what happened. That's when cases get approved is when you, your story for approval is more convincing than, the story that you should not be approved. People often worry because there's such negativity sometimes online. Um, uh, lawyers contribute a lot to this saying how nasty insurance companies are, how nasty CPP is. Um, what was your experience with the adjudicator? Was this a nasty mean person looking for any reason to cut you off? Uh, disrespectful on the phone? Like what kind of, what was your experience? And I know it's just your one experience, but what was your experience dealing with the adjudicator? I actually, all the people I spoke to were more than professional. They do somewhat hold back a little bit because I'm sure that when I was telling her what I'd been going through, that she was feeling a little emotional. I mean, if, if somebody else told me what I was telling her, what the things that I've gone through, I, I would be emotional. So, but she... She was she was great in the sense that, you know, she promised me she would call me back, you know, in a in a fairly short time period for the second call, which she did, mm -hmm. and you know she she was great, um, you know, in the sense that I think she asked all the right questions, yeah, and I think that um, you know she. She was not in any way trying to trip me up in some way to try to get me to say something, the wrong thing or, or anything like that. I it was like a, yeah, it was like a conversation with, yeah. with, a, with my doctor. I mean, it, it was kind of like a conversation with my doctor and I have no, um, no complaints at all in, in, um, you know, in, in, the, in the process for sure. Um, I mean, the four months or four and a half months, whatever that time yeah, period was, like, it, it's a long way. It's a long-term time to wait. Yeah, no, I, I, 
I I think that they were very professional and and uh, you know understanding and and, and all of that. Cause the CPP adjudicators are a special breed. They're all nurses, so people don't people don't go into nursing if they're not caring people, uh, if they don't have a sense of like you know ethics and things. So CPP is very unique in that most of these adjudicators, if not all, are registered nurses. So you're getting someone who has a good background and also someone who's a caring person. Um, now they can't approve every claim, but they are, they are, I encourage people to just do not hold back with them. Don't think that they're trying to like manipulate things. Uh, more often than not, if they're asking for more information, it's to, to help you. Um, they're not trying to look, you know, I, again, there's obviously going to be the odd bad person out there, but I really want to encourage people to be cooperative with these adjudicators and realize that they have, they're not out to get you in my experience at all, at all. Some of the best, if not the best, I'm pretty, it's pretty safe to say they are the best claim managers in Canada because of their background and the training they get. Now um, there are certainly claim managers and adjudicators and insurance companies who could reach the same level, but they don't all have a nursing background and, um, you know, they're, they're coming in with some of them with, and they could get good over time. But I think you're, we're in good hands in Canada. We're very lucky that to have these adjudicators have this level of professionalism and background. So I, I would, I just wanted to have you talk about that experience. Now it doesn't mean that they're all going to be good. So, but by and far, I've not seen per unprofessionalism with these nurses at all. Well, Rob, we're getting near the end here. Is there any other advice you would have for people um, who are thinking about applying for CPP disability. I mean, we've gone through some of what made your case successful. This idea that you did not just drop everything and apply at the first sign of trouble. You tried several jobs, which is hugely important. The other key thing you did was try everything medically and it, you did not go to war with your own doctor, even though your doctor was not supportive of you applying for a while. That's so important. And uh, the third big thing you did for me was that you did not send in the bare minimum application. You, you actually sent the whole medical file, which is such a smart move. I don't, you, you made the, such the right decision there. Um, and um, you also attached a lot of extra information, but is there anything else you would advise for people watching this who were thinking, uh, look, they're, they're, they're in your situation, either they're still working um, or they're trying to do the application. I, you know, if, if anybody does go to my, YouTube channel. Um, one of the things that I would suggest um, anybody that has, you know, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, whatever limits you from being able to work and, you know, you're going through the process to apply for CPP um, is, is, you know, it's, it's not a death sentence. Um, Sure, I hate getting up every day and some days feeling like I got run over, as I would say to my right, my wife, you know, I feel like I got run over by a peony, you know, back from the Flintstones. I don't know if you remember that. I'm, <laughs> yes, old I do. I'm old enough for that. You know, I, yeah, and I, you know, I'll, I'll say I, I, that's how I feel today. But, you know, that that's one of the reasons I started that channel was because there's things that I took the time to figure out after being diagnosed. Um, and, and even part of those, you know, the, the adjudicator asked me what I planned to do. And I said, I will try to keep as busy as possible um, any way I can. So, you know, I, you know, I have stuff on my YouTube channel that references tax advantages that you can use if you have very low income, like only CPP, um, you know, try to keep a, a stiff upper lip, try to do the best you can with what you've got. Um, people want to help people that help themselves. Um, you know, so the adjudicators, you know, I don't know if, if people might get disapproved because they just seem like they're just going to, throw in the towel and I hate to use that word, yeah. but you know, they, they, they want you to keep trying. Um, I think that's kind of ingrained in their program is that, it is. you know, they, they want you to, they, they want you to keep trying. And, and, you know, I, I explained to the adjudicator that, you know, I was going to the Y 
I would go one one day a week, maybe two, and I would just go in the pool and then the whirlpool would do very, very light, you know, any kind of exercise with weights and stuff. And I said, yeah, I, I paid for it, but I said, I know it's going to help me um, in the long run. So I guess what I'm trying to say is don't, don't think it's a death sentence. It, it's not. It, 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 it's, it's what you make. It's what you can make of it with what you've been dealt. Exactly. Um, when I applied, when I decided to apply for CPP and like the disability tax, tax credit, I did it in the same effort that I've always done and everything I've always done. That effort is what got me approved of, you know, the way it did. It's just another phase in my life, and 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 uh, and that's why I'm doing this today because I want to help people because they, they, you know, there's so many people. Um, you know, I'm a member of some Facebook groups, and you know, unfortunately, there's some people on there that post and you know, like they're like life has ended, and and I can, you know what, I can understand mm-hmm. <laughs> the way you feel some days. Absolutely, but life hasn't ended. Life hasn't ended, and, and you know, do the best you can and move forward. Now, Rob, where uh, where can people find you online? We've mentioned your YouTube channel; it's called uh, Canadian Senior Retirement. Is there anywhere else? Uh, any other things you have that you want to talk about? Or Canadian Senior Living in Retirement? I, right. Sorry, that's it. Uh, I'm going to put a link down. Below. I also have a, a blog called Brain Rattle, all one word dot yeah. dot info. Yep. Um, we'll put a link and, for that too. And I've, uh, I wrote articles about everything from inequality to. <laughs> yeah. To, I read uh, all, it's all fantastic. It's all fantastic. I do encourage people to go there. One of the things, and we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but one of the things I would say is that, um, I, I always focus on legal aspects of things, but it's interesting. A lot of your, your videos and, um, and articles are very useful because they talk about, okay, you're, you're off in retirement, you're on CBB disability, what are some ways you can maximize things? And, and uh, there, there's different, you've talked about uh, different uh, tax things that you can do. And there's, it's quite interesting, the information there. So I would highly recommend everyone go check that out. And uh, Rob, I guess that's it. I really appreciate this. And you are our first guest on this program. And uh, we really appreciate you agreeing to do this. Well, thank you very much. And um, I actually... I feel like I know some of the people that you work with after watching all the videos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so awesome. I tell, them, I tell them, thank you very much. Absolutely. And, and I thank you as well, because, um, you know, the, the your, your kindness and your, um, your willingness to put out education on your right. site um, you know, I, I know that you're there also to make a living, but, yep. um, you know, the fact that you've, you've taken resources and, and trying to educate people and giving them a chance to do it on their own first. Exactly. Um, if I, if I wouldn't have been successful, you, you could be rest assured that I would dial in your phone number. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you for that. Now we appreciate, I really appreciate those comments. Uh, we really we're education first. And uh, that comes from, I won't get into the whole story there, but I did have an experience as a 10 year old where my grandfather basically was a simple guy, a fisherman and got kind of bamboozled by the legal system, uh, lost a winnable case. It was very, very traumatic for our whole family. So that put me on this path to say, people should have the education to be able to make the best possible decisions, uh, including whether or not to get a lawyer. And you certainly did that in this case, Rob, you made such smart decisions and you're a perfect example for people to follow. Um, And with that, I will call this thing to an end and and I do wish you all the best and hopefully we'll stay in touch. Okay, Dave. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend.